For most of the 20th century, Americans felt themselves immune from terrorist attacks at home. Political extremists, they thought, waged their fanatical wars on someone else somewhere else. But all that changed with the huge explosion at the World Trade Center on February 26, 1993. From that day forward, many Americans would never again feel quite so secure, quite so safe within the walls of their workplace. For those who were there, it was nothing less than a message from heaven. Let's go get oxygen. I was in the 92nd floor. We got the guard call. And something was, I don't know what's in my head, the vine, some, some sort of explosion. It was just afternoon, 12.18 p.m. The jolt from the underground blast made all 110 stories shudder. And in the immediate aftermath, there was some confusion about what had happened and about the extent of the damage. Oh, I know I was walking through the tunnel down here, and all of a sudden the lights went in out a little, and boom, a big explosion it was. For a time, no one knew exactly what had gone wrong. Not the office workers who struggled through noxious smoke and soot to get out. Not the rescue workers who had to get everyone out before putting out two subsequent fires. You couldn't tell exactly where it happened. Right. Because everything came, one wall came out here, wall up doors came down another spot. It's just a mess. Ah, watch, watch the axe on here. You got two axes as a split. The number of injured would top 1,000. Those who were able streamed out of the choking smoke into the snow flurries. People left everything behind. They were just concerned about getting out of there. Looks like something out of a made-for-TV movie of a high-rise fire. The only difference is this is the real thing. Hundreds of police officers and almost half the firefighting equipment in the entire city of New York converged on Lower Manhattan, the heart of the Wall Street financial district. One, two, three! We could hear voices screaming. We made our way maybe 50, 75 yards in. The voices were getting louder. Man, when we got down there, we got down about, I would say, three, 400 feet in. Well, we were met by a man coming out, uh, severely injured. I don't know how he lived. Total darkness, walls, concrete walls have collapsed. People are crawling out from underneath that. A lot of people's trapped. Some people probably still trapped inside. The explosion wreaked havoc on the World Trade Center's internal communications and power systems. It knocked local television stations off the air. And it challenged area hospitals that were inundated with the injury. Just the tremendous volume of patients is just a major problem, just uh, evaluating everybody. I'm seeing smoke inhalation combined with uh, trauma from glass that was flying around, from bricks that fell on people, some head injuries. And back at the Trade Center, the extent of the damage underground astonished rescue workers. The situation down in the garage section, it were cars blown apart, the floors were buckled, there was a 50-foot section of floor completely missing down there, and we had no idea of the severity of the explosion. The explosion in the World Trade Center's underground public parking garage blasted through five stories of concrete and steel above and below it, leaving a massive crater as wide as a football field. Officials say most of the building's primary power supply was knocked out by the explosion. The remaining power lines were purposefully shut off in order to fight the fire. Then, the backup emergency generators located in the sub-basement were knocked out by flooding from cracked water pipes. The devastation was uh, uh, indescribable. Uh, uh, I don't think I could stand here and to describe you what we saw down in the basement. Six bodies were found at ground zero under the number one tower. But many more fatalities had been feared, especially among those trapped inside stalled elevators that quickly filled with thick black smoke. We had to force the elevator door open, and we opened the door, and these people were just, it looked like a scene from a movie. They were just laying on the floor. They didn't move, and it was just, it was incredible. And there was a husband and wife team in there who had said, what did they say to you? First thing they asked for each other when they finally revived, we revived them. The first thing they asked was, where's my wife, where's my husband? And it was kind of a nice, nice scene. Not the scene was anything but nice in the dark and smoke-laden stairwells 
where those trying to get out found themselves literally in the dark, leaderless, and gasping for air. And there was just, there must have been eight or 10,000 people in the building without exaggeration. And everybody starts screaming. We all ran out. There was millions of people trampling over each other. You had to kind of go on your instincts. What you felt was right because no one around you knew anything. It was like a herd instinct. And we could not communicate with uh, the people who were uh, uh, stranded on the uh, floors and uh, in, the, uh, in the stairwells. It was chaos because you didn't know whether the fire was below you or above you. You didn't know which way to go, and it was just madness. And we didn't think we were going to get out. We didn't think we were going to get out at all. I figured they'd just come and find 150 dead bodies up here. I suppose the thing that's most amazing is that more people weren't killed, uh, especially having occurred at the hour that it did and in the place that it did. Down by the kitchen area, there's people. It was also a day of heroes. When acts of bravery became almost commonplace. Yeah, we heard one woman moan, so we knew that someone was alive. Uh, Mike gave an urgent. We got a lot of people up on the floor. Uh, we gave our masks to the people so they could breathe. Then there were the grown-ups who sang with the kindergarten class from Brooklyn, huddled on the rooftop observation deck for three hours in the February cold. The people that came from the other offices uh, offered pieces of clothing, outer clothing for the children that d didn't have gloves, and many of them came over and said, could we offer you some help? Firefighters climbed all the way up to the roof, 110 flights, to lead the children down to the street. What was it like John? on the roof all those hours? Did you ever get scared, John? No, a little bit only. Maybe a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, John Sr., when you finally saw your son and you got a chance to put your arms around him, what was that like? Oh, the, the feeling was unbelievable. I had tears coming out, we were all crying and everything, and he wanted to know why. It was like, uh, I don't know. <laughs> Another group of visiting kindergarten children spent five hours trapped inside a stalled pitch black elevator, hundreds of feet above the Trade Center's main floor. What kept them going, the teacher said later, it was a combination of prayers, milk, and cookies. Everyone's okay, thankfully. Just a little shook up, and they want their mother, they want to go home. While these and other stories of rescue and heroism were unfolding, investigators were trying to determine what had caused the explosion. We will not speculate. Uh, it is important that we leave our minds open to all the possibilities of what might have happened. But it didn't take long to reach what appeared to be an obvious conclusion. Uh, there is an immense crater. It's very difficult to imagine what else could have done it other than a bomb. And two days later, the FBI confirmed that the explosion was caused by a massive bomb weighing more than 1,200 pounds. So it was placed perfectly uh, to cause as much damage as possible to the infrastructure of the building. The FBI also concluded it was the work of more than one person. Uh, just because of the size of the explosion and the probable size of the device, we tend to think it wouldn't be a lone individual. While the explosion had not been labeled a terrorist act, the Joint Terrorist Task Force, a special squad made up of FBI agents, New York police, and agents from the Federal Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, immediately joined the case. Investigators say since the explosion, they've received at least 19 calls from people yeah. claiming responsibility for the blast. But they say it's impossible at this point to determine whether any of those calls are legitimate. Within 48 hours, the number of callers had jumped to 60, all claiming responsibility for a bombing which had caused six deaths and more than a thousand injuries. Property damage ran into the millions. There are millions of things you don't know. What's your concern right now? Our immediate concern is uh, the copycat uh, people, the weirdos that may come out of the woodwork now after they see that something like this is possible. Uh, someone who thinks he gets instructions from God. I, I tell you, and I say this without hesitation, uh, we will solve this case no matter how long it takes. Now, that's the kind of bravado you expect from the FBI and, and law, law enforcement. But in your own mind, are, are you absolutely confident you'll catch these people? Yes, I am. I think I can say without qualification there is no higher priority for all of law enforcement in the United States today than solving this case.
Once they began to suspect that the World Trade Center bombing was an act of terrorism, perhaps international terrorism, federal authorities were faced with the urgent question, who did it and why? The U.S. had just begun humanitarian airlifts to the besieged Bosnian city of Sarajevo, so one theory suggested the Bosnian Serbs, in an act of revenge, were behind the bombing. Another theory? The bombing occurred on the second anniversary of Iraq's evacuation of Kuwait, so the authorities reasoned the bombing could be a retaliatory strike from Saddam Hussein. But that speculation was soon replaced by a solid lead from the wreckage in the parking garage. And in just six days, that lead turned into an arrest. The big break came when agents from alcohol, tobacco, and firearms zeroed in on the charred and mangled pieces of a yellow Ford van that had every mark of having carried the lethal explosives. And they found a piece of terribly charred and twisted steel, and, and they knew it was from the gearbox of a vehicle, and they said, this must have been right at the center of the explosion, and it looked a little... Jim Fox, in charge of the FBI in New York during the World Trade Center bombing, has retired from the Bureau and served as a consultant to CBS News. And they were able to raise the vehicle identification number, and so that was the first big break, and uh, any cop will tell you it's great to have experience, budget, uh, the latest equipment, Give me luck any time, and that's what we had on that occasion. Federal agents traced the van to a Ryder car rental agency in Jersey City, where they say the suspect rented the vehicle in his own name the day before the bombing. After the blast, the suspect reported the van stolen and returned to the lot to retrieve a deposit. He reportedly gave clerks rental papers covered with nitrates, chemicals used in explosives. When the man returned for his deposit, police arrested Mohammed Salami, a 25-year-old Jordanian who was in the U.S. illegally on an expired tourist visa. Investigators said that in addition to the van, Salami had also rented a storage locker containing chemicals and bomb parts. A lot of people say Mohammed Salami was a dumb terrorist, but I don't think it's generally known that the reason he kept going back to get his deposit was because he was trying to flee the country. Salame needed the refund to pay for a plane ticket. Instead, he was arrested. His phone calls and rental receipts provided investigators with a valuable trail, and additional arrests followed. Pretty soon we had uh, all of the main conspirators, except for Ramzi Youssef who uh, had the common sense to flee New York out of JFK the night of the bombing. It wasn't until two years after the bombing that Ramzi Youssef was arrested. Among the others arrested soon after the explosion was Nizal Ayad, who was an American citizen, an engineer, a graduate of Rutgers. I could never understand why he got involved in this thing because the United States gave him everything it can give to a person. Other than Nidal Ayad, who held a regular job and was part of the fabric of America, uh, the rest were, uh, were drifters. The four young men charged with the bombing of the World Trade Center were all from the Middle East. All were Islamic fundamentalists. And they shared something else, too. And the common link was with the clergyman, the blind sheikh, Omar Abdul Rahman. They all worshipped him uh, almost as a god. All these men were in their mid-twenties and early thirties. They were quite impressionable, and they, they looked up to Omar Abdul Rahman. Fouad Ajami is professor of Middle East Studies at Johns Hopkins University, and he has served as a consultant to CBS News. The deference toward him is remarkable. He was, he was the authority in, the, in religious law. When investigators traced the movements of Mohammed Salame and other suspects in the World Trade Center bombing case, they were led to this rundown building across the Hudson River in Jersey City. On the second floor was a mosque, the Masjid al Salam, a name which ironically means Mosque of Peace. And these mosques became, in many ways, radical political cells, more than they were conventional conservative houses of worship. And it was here that a firebrand leader held forth, Sheikh Omar Abdel Rahman, preaching Islamic militancy. If he gave something his blessing, that meant they would do it. In the beginning, I would like to... But the Sheikh denied any involvement in the World Trade Center bombing. 
وأبين أن الإسلام يأبى ذلك ولا يقره. I'm saying that Islam does not condone this kind of violence. What you say and what you do are two different things. It's the skill of Amr Abdul Rahman uh, to always say he's not involved in, uh, in the operational side of things, uh, to always say he's just a preacher. Although suspected, Sheikh Omar Abdul Rahman was not arrested in the World Trade Center case, but as the investigation deepened, FBI agents made an alarming discovery. In late May of 93, uh, our agents came in and started briefing me on another conspiracy, also involving the blind sheikh. And this was a conspiracy to blow up tunnels, bridges, the United Nations, the FBI building here in New York City. I just couldn't believe it. This exclusive CBS News videotape shows FBI agents in New York bringing in suspects. Eight Muslim fundamentalists are now in custody in what's being called one of the most significant terrorist busts in U.S. history. All of the men arrested were charged with plotting to bomb New York City landmarks and more. Sources say the group also planned to assassinate Egyptian President Hosni Mubarak, United Nations Secretary General Boutros Boutros Ghali, and New York Senator Alphonse D'Amato, who has taken a hard line against Arab extremists. This time, Sheikh Omar Abdul Rahman was arrested. Until then, most Americans had never heard of the clerk, but he was very well known in his native Egypt. He was born to poverty. Uh, he um, became blind at, at, uh, in his first year uh, of birth. He was 10 months old when he became blind. Uh, and then he was faced uh, with the kinds of e uh, question that uh, an impoverished Egyptian child of, of, uh, of his class and time uh, was faced with. What would he do with his life? Uh, he studied religion. He became a magnetic fundamentalist preacher who urged his followers to overthrow the secular government of Egypt and replace it with an Islamic theocracy. Soon or later, that an, an Islamic government will be established in Egypt. And if the American is still helping that aggressor regime in Egypt, our uh, relationship with America will not be okay. The Sheikh's words were a declaration of jihad, holy war, or sacred combat. We're talking about people who, who took a look at Islam and politicized it. And they went into the doctrines of Islam uh, and made them into weapons of destruction. I think the problem in the area of terrorism from the Muslim extremists comes from those who believe in the principle of jihad, the holy war against Israel and against the West. These are not religious people. Uh, in the old conventional sense of the term. These are warriors, uh, they are wreckers, they are destroyers, they are avengers. Long before the bombing of the World Trade Center, Sheikh Rahman wrote these words, it is the duty of all Muslims to sacrifice and do jihad. He's good at this. This is his skill. His skill is to get others to do his dirty work. There is a skill of, inc of inciting troubles um, and, and, and causing fires uh, and being able to walk away. In 1990, the Sheikh came to the United States on a tourist visa, even though he was on a State Department list of suspected terrorists. The official explanation for the lapse which allowed him entry, a computer error at the U.S. Embassy in Sudan, where the Sheikh obtained his visa. But that may have been just a cover story. Many people in the Egyptian secular elite are convinced that the Americans were up to no good, that the Americans were uh, hedging their bets uh, on Egypt. That they thought, well, in case that there is um, uh, an Islamic revolution, an Islamic upheaval in, in Egypt, if Omar Abdurrahman is going to be the Khomeini of Egypt, so to speak, then the Americans wanted to make sure that they had taken a side bet on him. Okay. By having the Sheikh in the U.S., the theory goes, the Americans could not only keep a close eye on him, but be in position to develop a diplomatic relationship with Sheikh Rahman if he ever succeeded in taking over the government in Egypt. But of course, it did not work out that way. They had hedged their bets and that they had paid for their own, um, if you will, uh, cunning. Once inside the U.S., settled in an upstairs mosque in Jersey City, 
The Sheikh had no trouble maintaining his campaign of subversion against Egypt's President Hosni Mubarak. Hosni Mubarak كتم الأنفاس وقضى على الحريات. Mubarak destroyed all the freedom in Egypt. And it's a mistake to call him President Mubarak. He should be called King Mubarak. This group that congregated around Omar Abdul Rahman in Jersey City and Brooklyn, uh, they were not overwhelmingly educated. And they wanted him to be their leader. They wanted him to define what Islam tolerates and accepts, what is permissible. That was the role of Sheikh Omar Abdul Rahman. When he believes in something, he believes in it. And he will do it, no matter what the cost to him. And the Sheikh did just that, providing justification for violent action, it turned out, on both sides of the Atlantic against the Mubarak government and against its biggest support. So who is the great Satan in the world? The great Satan in the world is the preeminent superpower in the world. America is the great Satan. On September the 14th, 1993, nearly seven months after the World Trade Center bombing, the trial against four men charged in the case got underway. It took several weeks to find a jury, and the judge was assigned bodyguards around the clock for good reason. Security was intense at Manhattan's federal courthouse as prosecutors besieged with death threats began opening arguments in the most celebrated terrorist trial in U.S. history. The four on trial were Mohammed Salami, who prosecutors said rented the van used in the bombing, the apartment where bomb materials were mixed, and the locker where they were stored. He also allegedly bankrolled the bombing with money passed through a mysterious source in Germany. Nidal Ayad, the naturalized U.S. citizen and chemical engineer who reportedly ordered the chemicals for the bomb. Mahmoud Abu Halima, reportedly present for the bomb building, he escaped to his native Egypt after the bombing, was arrested there, and was returned to New York for trial. And Ahmad Ajaj, a Palestinian arrested at Kennedy Airport in possession of four passports, each in a different name, along with manuals for building bombs. Prosecutors told jurors circumstantial evidence would prove their guilt, but there are no eyewitnesses who actually saw the bomb being planned or planted. And so, in attempting to prove their case, they decided to proceed very slowly. So far, the trial has been moving at a snail's pace as prosecutors introduced dozens of vehicle fragments, apparently from the van carrying the bomb. Any bombing case is going to be a, a, a laboratory and a forensics case. And that's what this was, and I know a lot of the media got tired of covering it because of all these experts coming in and testifying to things they might not have understood, and I certainly didn't understand. Uh, but that, that, that's how you make a bombing case. Maybe so, but when prosecutors turned their attention to identifying the defendants, they were undermined by one of their own principal witnesses. The prosecution in the World Trade Center bombing was dealt a blow yesterday when a key witness failed to identify suspects in the case. Asked to identify two men who drove the rental van carrying the bomb, the witness ignored the defendants and pointed out two members of the jury. The next day, the witness changed his mind and fingered the defendants, but then the prosecution blundered its way into another embarrassment. This week, prosecutors came under fire for showing circumstantial evidence like this video that allegedly belonged to one of the defendants. It depicts a simulated bombing of an American embassy under chanting that urges Muslims to fight against Americans. Prosecutors told the jury it was a terrorist training video. Jurors laughed when defense attorneys later revealed that most of the sensational scenes came from an American movie, Death Before Dishonor, starring former football star Fred Dreyer. Despite those problems, the government still had a strong case due to a huge mountain of physical evidence. In time, the pressure of the case took its toll on two defense lawyers who buckled as they made their closing arguments. Counsel for Salome and Ayad admitted for the first time their clients were involved in the bomb plot, but argued they had been duped by other defendants. And I could see all of the other defense attorneys in the courtroom just rolling their eyes back into their heads saying, my God, what is he doing? 
This led to an unusual development the next day. A defendant in the World Trade Center bombing trial is now disputing the closing arguments of his own attorney. The attorney said Mohammed Salame was involved in the bombing, though the attorney said he was tricked into it by the alleged mastermind. Well, Salame now says the lawyer got it wrong. Salame now insists he is innocent. But the jury didn't buy Salame's story, and after deliberating for six days, they found all four men guilty as charged. This verdict should send a clear and unmistakable message that we will not tolerate terrorism in this country. The emotions ran high on sentencing day. Ed Smith, whose wife, pregnant with the couple's first child, was among the six people killed in the blast, told the court, I lost my best friend, my only son. I'll never be able to hold him. But there was no remorse from any of the Muslim fundamentalists. Mohammed Salame told the judge in Arabic, I wonder how long I will remain in prison until the government reveals I'm innocent. Like the others, he said, I won't beg for mercy. And Judge Kevin Duffy gave none, calling them sneaks and cowards. He added up the life expectancies of the six victims in the World Trade Center bombing, and then the judge sentenced each of the defendants to the total, 240 years with no parole. I hope that it sends a verdict that they can't get away with doing this in the United States. But seven months later, in January of 1995, the issue of terrorism was back in the courts again, as Sheikh Omar Abdel Rahman and 11 co-defendants went on trial for the broader plot to blow up New York landmarks. But this trial was very different from the World Trade Center bombing. In the Sheikh conspiracy case, we had a live informant, we had tape recordings, we had video recordings of these guys actually putting the bomb together, actually talking about who would get the safe house, who would get the detonators. We had the videotapes of them actually mixing the so-called witch's brew uh, I said, we'll make that case. At the time, the Sheikh's lawyer disagreed. That it's just not going to hold up, just as it didn't hold up in Egypt. 